This morning's scripture lesson is from Romans 15, 1 through 7. We who are strong must be considerate of those who are sensitive about things like this. <clears throat> we must not please ourselves. We should help others do what is right and build them up in the Lord. For even Christ did not live to please himself. As the scripture says, the insults of those who insult you, O God, have fallen on me. Such things were written in the scriptures long ago to teach us. And the scriptures give us hope and encouragement as we wait patiently for God's promises to be fulfilled. May God, who gives his patience and encouragement, help you to live in complete harmony with each other, as is fitting for followers of Christ Jesus. Then all of you can join together with one voice, giving praise and glory to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, accept each other just as Christ has accepted you, so that God will be given glory. The word of God for, pe for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Alan. I invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to Romans chapter 15. We will be in verses 1 through 7 this morning as we kick off my usual summer reboot series. As many of you are aware, the last few summers I've started to pick up the tradition of going back and reworking our way through a series that I developed a number of years before. And so I went back and dug this one up. If you have really good memories, you can remember all the way back to 2017. You might remember this one, but I've entitled it Fruitful. It is about developing the marks of true discipleship. Uh, and the idea here is that we bring the greatest glory to God, we please God most when we are growing in our faith. And so we're going to be uh, taking about 10 weeks to work through these different marks of true discipleship, this method of bearing fruit that the Bible lays out for us. And I hope it will be as challenging to you as it has been to me. So today we begin with the first fruit, which is the fruit of grace that Paul is talking about uh, in Romans. Uh, it reminds me of a story told by a woman by the name of Janine Shepard in a best-selling autobiography that she wrote a number of years ago called Defiant. In 1986, Janine Shepard was 24 years old. Uh, she was at the peak of health and fitness. She was training for the Olympics that were coming up in 1988 and she was going to represent Australia in uh, cross-country skiing. You don't tend to associate Australia with cross-country skiing but apparently she was so good at that that they actually were favoring her to win the first ever Olympic medal for Australia in cross-country skiing and so uh, one day she was out on a biking run doing some training doing some conditioning when she was hit by a utility truck and her whole life changed in that moment. Her uh, back was broken, her ribs were broken, a broken arm, a broken leg. Uh, internal injuries were extremely severe. For a time, doctors didn't think she would pull through and they put her into a medically induced coma. And when she emerged from that, uh, they gave her devastating news. They told her, you will probably never walk again. You will never have children. You will never have a normal life. And after going through a period of despair, like many people do, uh, she became determined to prove the doctors wrong. And Defiant is the story of how she not only regained the ability to walk again, uh, but she also went on to change careers and she became uh, the first female stunt pilot in Australian history. Uh, she later made a bid to go back to the Olympics in uh, horseback riding. She was not successful in that, but she got very, very close. And in the process, she also married and had three beautiful children. One of the things she reflects on in her book is how the accident was good for her and how it really was an expression of God's grace. Because prior to the accident, like many people who were very talented and gifted, she was arrogant. She was self-sufficient. She felt like she did not need anybody else. And yet, in the process of recovery and becoming a different person, she discovered that she did need other people. She says this, my accident was a gift. I wouldn't be the person I am today if I hadn't gone through those challenges. 
Real strength has nothing to do with our physical bodies. We all have this incredible innate capacity to defy and overcome whatever we face in life. Some of you are facing some monumental challenges today. Some of you are struggling with challenges that seem to have lasted for far too long. And they've got you burdened, they've got you weighed down. And so God's word to us this morning is that His grace is not only reaching out, but it's accomplishing a higher purpose in the midst of our pain. This is the message, the overall message that Paul is giving to the church in Rome. They are on their own journey, a journey of courage and brokenness and reconciliation. Here's the historical uh, setting, the context in which the book of Romans is set in 49 AD, so f almost 50 years after the death of Christ. Uh, we've got uh, Christianity that's blossoming, that's uh, becoming a big thing in Rome, and many of the Jews are converting to Christianity. They're becoming Jewish converts, and in the midst of this, this horrible thing happens. The Emperor Claudius decides that all Jews are expelled from Rome, and so these people are ripped out of their homes. Many of them are prominent business people. Many of them have comfortable lives, and they're sent into hiding outside of Rome. Uh, thankfully, five years later, uh, Claudius is taken out of the game. He dies, but it takes a while for people to recover, and it's not until 57 AD, so eight years after this whole problem started, that the first Jews start to move back into Rome. And so the book of Romans is written just a little bit after the Jews start to move back. In 58 AD, he's writing this letter to the Romans. And one of the issues he is addressing is, okay, nine years have gone by. The church has moved on. Things have changed. And now these people are coming back in. And that transition is tough. There are going to be conflicts. There are going to be challenges. The question is, how will you handle this? Uh, Kenneth Birdie says this, he, Upon their return to Rome, the Jewish Christians were placed in the awkward situation of having to assimilate into groups that felt foreign to them. Tensions emerged over who was in charge and how Gentile Christians were supposed to relate to the Jews. Paul has a mess on his hands. The uh, Christian church in Rome has a mess on its hands. And Paul's first word to them is, it's time to extend grace. We're going to see today uh, that there are three everyday expressions of grace that Paul encourages people to extend to one another. Uh, we'll see that those are consideration, patience, and acceptance. Our one sentence sermon this morning is that grace is an extraordinary gift that manifests itself in the way that we treat others. The foundational thought for this morning is that grace begins to bear fruit in our lives when we not only accept it for ourselves, but also as we pass it on to those around us. I like uh, Dr. Henry Cloud's uh, definition of grace. Many times we're not sure what that really means. We sing about it a lot, we talk about it a lot, we read about it a lot, but what really is grace? And so here's what Cloud says. Many Christians misunderstand grace, but theologically it means that God is on our side and desires good for us, that he will freely give us things cannot provide for ourselves. And as we'll see today, many times those things we cannot provide for ourselves, God gives us through other believers. And so we begin with the first one, which is consideration. Uh, Paul encourages uh, the Christians in Rome, and he says, we who are strong must be considerate of those who are sensitive about things like this. In 1962, uh, Dick and Mary Hoyt uh, welcomed their newborn son, Rick, into the world, and immediately it was clear that there were problems. Uh, Rick uh, barely made it through the birthing process. The umbilical cord was wrapped around his neck, and he was deprived of oxygen for a time, and as a result, he had a severe case of cerebral palsy. And uh, The doctors told the family at that time, you know, Rick uh, probably has no idea what's going on around him. He's a vegetable. Uh, you should institutionalize him and move on and forget about him. And yet, both Dick and Mary, as they watched their baby boy, noticed that his eyes were following them wherever they went around the room, and they felt like there was life inside of uh, this body. And so they took the baby home, and they began to uh, talk to him, and to read to him, and to try to teach him. And it became apparent within a few years that uh, not only was Rick not a vegetable, but he was extraordinarily intelligent. He was just unable to communicate. And so as technology developed, 
Uh, they were able to provide him with computer assistance so that he was able to communicate, and immediately they learned what a bright and uh, full of life young man that they had uh, in their home. And in fact, one of the beautiful things about Rick was that he cared about other people. When he was 15 years old, he went to his father, who was 36 at the time, and he said, Dad, uh, they're doing a fundraiser for somebody at school who has leukemia, and they're doing uh, this two-mile race, and would you push me in the chair during the race? And his dad, uh, 36, had never been a runner, didn't really like running, but he did it in order to uh, appease his son. And so they went through the run, and when they finished, Rick turned to his dad and he said, you know, when we're running, it feels like my disability disappears. And immediately Dick saw a way to minister to and encourage his son. And so he began to go on training runs. And he would run with a wheelchair in front of him with a bag of cement in it uh, so that he could get stronger while his son was at school. And a, and a legacy unfolded, an adventure unfolded over the next 30 years or so. During that time, uh, they went they went together through over a 1,000 different races, and that includes, uh, I believe, 18 Boston Marathons. Uh, they also did the Ironman Triathlon together uh, six times. The Ironman is, uh, you do a two-mile open ocean swim, and so uh, Dick towed Rick behind him in a little boat attached to a rope around his waist while he swam, and then you bike 120 miles, and so he pulled him behind him in a cart, and then you run a marathon after that, as if that wasn't enough. And so they went through that six different times as well over the years. And I understand that uh, Dick actually passed away this last year. But it's a perfect illustration of what Paul is talking about here uh, when he uh, speaks of being considerate. Uh, the word here is actually two Greek terms, ophilio bastazo. Uh, it means to owe or be indebted to and also to carry or to take away or to Remove. So it's this idea that as believers, we have this obligation to one another that where it's possible, where it's appropriate, we say, that looks really heavy for you. Let me help you carry it. Let me help you deal with what you're going through in your lives. We see this word used in Galatians chapter 6, verse 2. Uh, Paul encourages believers to bastazo, to carry or bear one another's burdens. And in doing so, we fulfill the law of Christ. That brings us to uh, lie number one that was pointed out to us in this passage, which is uh, that people in church should never upset me, annoy me, frustrate me, or let me down. I won't ask you for a show of hands, but think to yourself, in all your time in church, has anybody ever upset you, annoyed you, frustrated you, or let you down? I think we can all agree the answer is a resounding yes, and that's because we are all human. I had a professor in seminary who used to joke that church would be a great place if it wasn't for all the people. And there's a lot of truth to that, isn't there? Uh, if, if you were looking for the problem in the church, first place to look is probably in the mirror. Our first, uh, our first idea that we want to talk about this morning is that we don't tolerate other shortcomings in the body of Christ, but instead we need to decide that we are going to gladly support God's people as they grow to maturity. And that brings us to truth number one that overcomes line number one, which is that people in church will upset me, they will annoy me, they will frustrate me, they will let me down because they, like me, are not yet a finished product. A great question to ask yourself when you uh, find yourself judging or being annoyed with somebody else at church is ask, I wonder if I've ever done that to somebody. And the answer is probably yes. Philippians chapter 2 says this, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. It's not all about me. It's not all about you. It's about the great mission that God is accomplishing through us as a body. Our first key point is that we don't show consideration for the needs of others, because we owe it to them, but because we owe it to Jesus. That is Paul's reminder to the Romans throughout the book, is don't do this just because I say it. Do it because of the sacrifice that Christ has made for you. Grace is designed to be passed along. So the first fruit of grace is consideration. The second is patience. Uh, 
So Paul says, I understand. I'm asking a lot of you here to be considerate of one another. And as you're being considerate, you're going to need patience. And so he prays, may God, who gives this patience and encouragement, help you live in complete harmony with each other as is fitting for followers of Christ. 1778, the American Revolution reached a very difficult turning point. Uh, Washington was on the run from British troops and they decided to winter in uh, sunny Valley Forge. If you've ever been to Valley Forge, Pennsylvania, you know that you do not want to be there in the winter. It is cold, there's a lot of snow, it is a miserable place to be and Washington's army was already struggling, they were already picked apart, and so as they huddled up in Valley Forge, Washington uh, made this observation in a letter that he wrote. He said, a part of the army has been a week without any kind of meat. Naked and starving as they are, we cannot enough admire the incomparable patience and fidelity of the soldiers that they have not been discouraged by their sufferings. And we know that they persevered and that good things came out of that. And so I ask you to think this morning, as you're considering, what is this thing in my life that's been troubling me? What, is, what role does patience play in your life? We pray for God to fix things. We pray for God to heal. We pray for God to move others to change. And yet, more often than not, we end up waiting before we get an answer to this prayer. Uh, the word patience here that he uses in the Greek, hupo mone, means to remain under burden. Remember, we just talked about how we are obligated in consideration to help one another bear their burdens, which implies that burdens stick around a lot longer than we would like them to. And so he says that as we're bearing these burdens together, we need to understand that you're going to remain under that burden sometimes, that you must show steadfastness and perseverance. Later on in Romans in chapter 5, Paul goes back to this idea and he says, hey, don't just put up with these sufferings. Don't just endure these sufferings, but he says we also can glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces hupomone, <laughs> perseverance. Perseverance produces character and character produces hope. In other words, there's a growth process that's taking place, painful though it may be. That brings us to line number two, which is that when I find myself frustrated or disappointed, it is a sign that God is punishing me. How many of you, I won't ask you again for a show of hands, but I wonder how many of you have wondered that at different times in your life. Uh, this thing won't go away. These bad things keep happening. Is God punishing me? And many times the answer is no. God is just developing patience within you. You see, we demonstrate patience and perseverance with others, not just out of obedience, but because we believe that God will use those experiences to enable us to grow and mature. It's not just an opportunity for others to grow, but for you to grow as well. That brings us to truth number two, which is that when I find myself frustrated or disappointed, it's not a sign that I'm being punished, but it's a sign that God is pushing me to produce fruit. It's an opportunity for you to stop and ask yourself, okay, where are my priorities out of line? Where are my energies misdirected? What am I missing in what God is asking me to do? Joyce Meyer makes a great distinction here. She says, patience is not the ability to wait. Waiting is just a fact of life. Patience is the ability to keep a good attitude while waiting. Our second key point is that patience is not passive endurance of less than ideal circumstances, but it is actively seeking opportunities to become more like Christ while trusting that God is in control. In the midst of your suffering, in the midst of these circumstances that you would rather not be in, what opportunities do you have to become more like Christ? So we have consideration, we have patience, lastly we have acceptance. Paul says it's going to take patience in order to bear the burdens of other people, but it becomes much easier when we decide to accept one another as we are. Therefore, he says in verse 7, accept each other just as Christ has accepted you so that God will be given glory. Uh, with a lot of the flooding that we've seen in the news in Europe, uh, it reminded me of uh, different times when I've seen flooding around me. There was some flooding when we lived down in Texas, and I remember seeing uh, the water going by, and there were these mounds of stuff that looked like wood chips uh, that 
were floating by. And what I learned later was that these were actually fire ants. So we call them fire ant islands. And what happens is that the fire ants realize that individually, if we all strike out on our own, we're going to get swept away. We're all going to be destroyed. And so they create these islands and they help each other survive. Uh, Tim Davis says this, when the water rises, the fire ants all grab a hold of each other. They can hold on for several days until they reach higher ground. It's this picture of a difficult time, a potentially devastating time where we have to marshal our resources, we have to come together, we have to latch on to each other. And so Paul is saying uh, this persecution was terrible, this persecution is coming to an end, and yet the worst is not yet over. We have to hold on to each other in the midst of it. The word Except here, proslambano in the Greek means to latch on with initiative. It means to move forward. It can also mean to receive with a strong personal interest. And so we see this picture of grabbing on to these people around us and saying, I'm going to hang on to you no matter what. Why? Because I care about you. Uh, we see an illustration of this in Acts chapter 18. Uh, the church is growing very rapidly and there are many converts that are coming in. And in the midst of this, there's a very gifted, charismatic man named Apollos who starts to preach. And, and Apollos is very enthusiastic, but he's not really doctrinally sound. And so uh, he's preaching some of the wrong things. And so rather than going out and running him off and saying, hey, how dare you talk? Be quiet. Get away from us. Instead, we're told that Priscilla and Aquila heard him preaching boldly in the synagogue and it says that they gently took him aside. They proslambano. They accepted him and they explained the way of God more accurately. You see what they're doing here. They're not threatened. They're not angry at him. They're saying, hey, great job. Here's some tips. Here are some things that maybe you want to tweak a little bit, that you want to fine tune. And that brings us to lie number three, which is that when people in the church mess up, I have to pretend like nothing happen. It's, it's one of the most awkward things as a pastor is people come to you and say, I don't know if you heard about this, but such and such did this, or this happened, or whatever it is. And then you find yourself in this awkward position of going, okay, when I see this person, what do I do? Do I bring it up? Do I pretend like I don't know? Uh, do I do the passive aggressive Christian thing where I like, well, I just want to know how to pray for you. And what we're really doing is pumping for gossip information. That kind of thing. What do we do? Well, here's what we know. Is that we practice acceptance with one another out of recognition that we all fall short of perfection and we all play a vital role in the life of the church. One of the most humbling things that will ever happen to you, and it will happen if it hasn't already, is when you judge other people, eventually you get an opportunity to be the one who's being judged. And other people are looking at you going, I don't know what's wrong with his life, but... Obviously, something's out of whack because things are going this way. And, uh, and you find out what it's like to be on the other side of that equation. And one of the uh, most wonderful things that can happen is when other people accept you. That brings us to truth number three, which is when people in the church mess up, instead of judging them, instead of ostracizing them, instead of pretending like nothing happened, we instead offer corrective support accompanied by grace. We don't just thump them over the head with a stick, but instead we point them back in the right direction. Uh, Matt Chandler puts it this way. He says, the marker of those who understand the gospel is that when they stumble and fall, they run to God and not from Him. They understand that their acceptance is not predicated on their behavior, but on the righteous life of Jesus Christ and His sacrificial death. The question we should ask ourselves is, is my approach to this person going to cause them to run toward Jesus or to run away from Him? Our last key point is that acceptance is not condoning all behavior. It's not ignoring hurtful actions, but it is pointing those who are striving back to God in love. Three questions to ask yourself as you move through your week. Number one, is my primary focus on my needs or on the needs of the others in the church? As we move through what is hopefully post-COVID piece of history here, uh, we have opportunities as the church to come back together, to begin to do things again, to reach out and serve the community. But just like the reconstituted church in Rome, we're going to have factions of people. There's going to be a temptation for this where people are saying, I've been here all throughout this and 
you've been MIA for the last 15 months, who are you to say what we're going to do? And so we're going to have to shift our focus to the needs of others in the church rather than my own needs. Number two, am I more concerned with avoiding discomfort or becoming more like Christ? What's my priority? And number three, do I love others enough to invest in their growth even when it's difficult? Let's pray. God, we thank you for the truth of your word. We thank you that the challenges and the struggles that we face are not unique to us, that they have been present since the beginning of creation. Lord, we pray that you would give us grace, that you would give us strength, that you would give us patience to deal kindly and gently and restoratively with one another. We pray you would continue to bless the work of your church in this community. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.